Digital Duo is brought to you by It's time for E-Trade, a proud sponsor of Digital Duo. Where can you find millions of books online? BarnesandNoble.com. If we don't have your book, nobody does. Providing network solutions for the internet revolution. Alcatel, tomorrow's networks, today. We've got all the equipment you need to metamorphose into a bona fide cyborg. We'll show you high-tech digital picture frames that'll put your pixels on a different kind of screen. We'll tell you about information that really isn't. And Walt Mossberg will give you an opinion that really is. All this and more bad, bad prizes from the PR Pinata on this edition of Digital Duo. I'm Steve Manis, columnist for Forbes magazine and PC World. I'm Susan Gregory Thomas, senior editor for U.S. News and World Report and columnist for New Woman. All right, you can open your eyes now. Oh, my God. <laughs> I feared this day would come, Steve. Voila, it's a wearable oh. computer. What do you think? Would it be better in like a burgundy or a teal? Hmm, well, maybe a Loden would be a little bit better, but really, it's you. Well, thank you. I had to say something. <laughs> But all you need is some kind of a weapon that attaches to your fingertips, like a laser. Yeah, no, I have a right I hand free, but that's not an optional extra, at least not yet. They're probably working on it. So seriously, what's up with this look? Hey, look, this is serious equipment. It's not a Star Trek Voyager costume. <laughs> this is one of the very few commercial computers that you're actually meant to wear. It's not a joke. It's a real product. It's the Zybernaut Mobile Assistant 4. The actual computer is right in this box here. This is the pointing stick. These are the two mouse buttons, and over here we have the battery pack. And the whole thing connects via this cable to the head-mounted display. And the display is up here. It reflects to me in a concave mirror, so it actually looks bigger. You've got a little microphone here. There's an earpiece in here. There's a camera over here. And there's also this optional keyboard. Okay, so I'm able to look at the manual or glance at the manual and glance back at the car and work on it while I'm looking at this thing. And if I had any idea what I was doing and which end of the wrench was up, I'd be fine. I do not think you'd want to use this on a crawler underneath there, though, because the tight space are going to get parts knocked off and it could be most unpleasant. So smile, I might be recording you. Interesting, right. Yeah. So how much does this thing weigh? Well, about uh, six and a half pounds for everything. And I admit it seemed a little clunky when I first put it on, but after an hour or yeah. so, I began to feel, you know, not exactly natural, but almost, almost comfortable. Though I gotta admit, I can't see all four edges of the screen clearly at the same time, and the pointing stick doesn't work the way I want it to. So and, uh, the question is, what's the point? Why bother? Well, this is new technology. <laughs> oh, cool. I see. <laughs> I mean, the idea is that it's for people who need to keep their hands free while getting access to things like manuals on a job site. And ideally, you should be able to control pretty much everything with, you know, voice commands for the mic, though I admit I haven't been able to make that feature work consistently yet, which makes the keyboard come in handy. Right. Well, I'm not really sure if that explanation answered my questions. Well, I'm not either. But look, there's know. a whole romance of these things. There's a lore. There's a history. There are guys who have been proselytizing for these things for years, and now they're finally here. And there are bigger ideas. I mean, think about it. In theory, you could surf the web while you were dancing, or you could use the camera to keep, like, a permanent video record of everything. You did kind of a diary. Okay. Those aren't exactly the applications that I would think of, but with a video diary, you'd run out of disk storage pretty quickly, right? Oh, that's right? true for now, and this model only comes with about a 4-gigabyte hard drive and a 233-megahertz processor, 
which doesn't give you a lot of storage. It's actually pretty skimpy for a unit that's going to do voice recognition. Yeah, definitely. And the grand total for mm, cost? Five and to five to ten thousand dollars. Three to five laptops. Well, yeah, if you put words. it that way. But you know, like everything else in the electronic world, these things will get faster, they'll get lighter and cheaper in a few years. Who knows? This whole thing may fit into a pair of sunglasses, and you can look at your hiking maps. While you're out in the grade out, you're not buying this. No, I'm not. Well, not until they fit into a pair of sunglasses. Actually, I mean, the truth is, this is not my first experience with wearable computers. I've seen them before. And for the cost and the dork factor, I just don't think that they're useful enough to warrant even mild consideration from consumers, unless you want to keep one on hand in case you get called for jury duty or something. Yeah, all kidding aside, I agree. But it may be a different story for people in industries like aerospace. I mean, somebody building a space shuttle could wear one of these and be looking at blueprints while she actually built the thing. And that's the kind of vertical market Cybernaut is going after. Right, exactly. But for the rest of us, absolutely not. I mean, I actually, this is a great story. I was interviewing a graduate student at MIT's Media Lab who was trying to impress me with the versatility of his wearable computer by saying stuff like, see, this thing would be great for reporters because I can look at you and type at the same time. And then he noticed that I was just sort of doing this. Oh, really? That's very interesting. I mean, I was jotting down his comments in shorthand in my paper notebook. I'll just never forget his face. He just stopped and looked at me and was like, gee, well, how do you do that? And I was like, I'm a reporter. Well, you're a seasoned professional. You've got a point. But I can see a day when guys will kill for these. I mean, think of the pickup line when you walk up. Ever danced with a guy who wears a computer? I can guarantee you women will run screaming in the opposite <laughs> direction. An even scarier line would probably be like, I've taken your picture with a built-in digital camera and matched it online with a phone database and have got your telephone number already, so I'll call you. Now, come on, smile. I'm your host, Shep Steneman, and welcome back to Manual Dexterity, the game where our contestants show just how easy it is to set up hardware and software. Our champion today is Shero G Master Youngs. You've done great so far, but now it's time for the lightning round. Of course, you have to do it all within one minute, and as you know, every answer needs to be phrased in the form of a question. So you ready, Cheryl? Hey, I'm as ready as a Windows computer that started booting 15 minutes ago and didn't go into sleep mode. That's the attitude we're looking for. Okay, here we go. Here's the answer directly quoted from a printed manual. It is now time to replace your computer's original IDE ribbon cable with the three-connector EIDE ribbon cable provided in the package. On most computers, the connectors are keyed in such a way that it is impossible to install this cable incorrectly. However, this may not be the case in your computer. To ensure that the cable is... Oh, not what, what is the step 12 of the 18-step process for installing a Yamaha CDRW drive? That's right. Too easy. Next quote. A. Right-click on My Computer and select Properties. B. Click on the Device Manager tab. C, select devices by type, make sure the computer icon is highlighted, and click on the properties button. D, make sure interrupt request, IRQ, is selected, and review the list of 0 to 15 IRQ assignments. E, if all the IRQs are used, you will need to free an oh, interrupt. Oh, what, what is the PC card adapter for the click drive? Ooh, that was a tough one, because it could also have been almost any IDE card. Very good. Next quote. Simply load the software CD, plug in the mm-mm, mm-mm, and our mm-mm quick tour will get you started in minutes. Oh, God, I know, I know this one. It's, it's on the back of the box. You don't even get the printed manual with it. You just get the disk, and it's, it's, oh, it's the, um, it's the Intel PC camera pack. Oh, I'm so sorry. Of course it is, but you neglected to phrase it in the form of a question. But as we say every week, it's certainly been... Instructive. Right, and as our returning champion, you'll have another chance to match wits with those manuals next time. Tune in when we devote our whole show to the category Readme Files on Manual Dexterity. Bye. you wouldn't think could ever go digital. Like a picture frame. And of course, you would be totally wrong. Yeah, in the digital world, if it can be done, it will be done. And sure enough, we now have the spectacle of the digital picture frame. 
you put it on your desk, you set it up in slideshow mode, and presto, your photo collection, or a very tiny part of it, flashes on the screen again and again. Now, the first one that either one of us saw was what Sony now calls the digital photo frame. Yeah, I mean, it's basically designed to do one thing, displaying pictures, and it's supposed to do it well. But here's the reality. Because it's a single-purpose device with a small potential market, it's really, really pricey. This baby costs, ready, about $900. And it's no prize on the performance front. The screen's only 5.5 inches diagonally, and it doesn't even have as many dots as a standard 640 by 480 screen, which is pretty coarse to begin with. And it's got a fairly narrow viewing angle, so it looks different when you're standing up and when you're sitting down. And the tilt angle doesn't adjust except to change from horizontal to vertical. A memory stick goes in here. That's Sony's proprietary kind of memory, which you'll increasingly find in the company's cameras, including some digital VCRs. Then you can take the images from the memory stick. You can reach some of the controls from the top, but for others, you have to swing out the control panel like this. The controls are pretty darn simple. Basically, play the slideshow, display the next image or the last one. You can see thumbnails. You can fine tune things like the number of seconds between images. But that's about it. I mean, you can't even change the order they play in. But hey, you can swap this green frame for this brown one, which comes right inside the box. Yeah, Yee. for 900 bucks, getting it two frames, what a deal. All and right. check this out. To turn it on and off, you're supposed to put your hand in front of this little sensor for three seconds. But because nothing happens until you pull your hand away, you never know whether it's going to work or not. This is my nominee for the stupidest, supposedly simple interface of the year. Right, but Sony is not the only game in town. If you're in the mood for something larger and somewhat more flexible, a company called ArtPix sells this 15-inch model for uh, $2,000. Yeah. There's supposed to be a 12-inch unit with fewer features for about half as much, but as we shoot this show, that one's not shipping. And neither is a larger model that's supposed to be more expensive. Yeah, the ArtPix model has got most of what a notebook computer has, except the keyboard, though it does have a keyboard port. It weighs as much as many notebook computers, though, and the software is this proprietary form based on the Linux kernel, so the machine can't do nearly as much as a Windows computer or a Mac, except crash. Yes, <laughs> Linux fans, I know you're shocked, but several times the unit locked up totally, requiring a trip to the power switch. Shocking. Anyway, <laughs> unlike the Sony, the ArtPix reads images from a built-in CD-ROM or standard memory cards like Smart Media, Compact Flash, they fit into a PC card holder. It also has a built-in hard drive to store the images and arrange your presentations, and you control everything from this little remote. But since it essentially uses its own operating system, forget about PowerPoint, which runs on Windows. You're probably saying, yes, if only I could forget about PowerPoint. <laughs> Indeed, that was what I was about to say. <laughs> but the real problem here, aside from the very significant limitations, is that this thing is slow. I mean, you sit there waiting and waiting for images to come up, and you say, how can this thing possibly take that long? Well, it turns out this is based on 486 chip technology. No wonder it's so slow. A 486 chip is ancient history, particularly for graphic applications like rendering pictures. Right, so when it comes to picture frames that display your photographs, I think it's time to get out those old picture hangers. Yeah, they are, however, great material for what you call lifestyles of the rich and gadget happy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and now for the full picture, Walt Mossberg. Don't you hate those obnoxious pop-up ads on America Online? The ones that offer you supposedly great deals by opening an unwanted window that covers up whatever else you're doing, whether you like it or not. And how about when you register for a website or a software product, and the next thing you know, you're getting unsolicited email offering you upgrades or related products. This sort of brute force, in-your-face marketing is the worst aspect of the online world, in my view. Of course, you can turn most of this off or opt out of it if you know where the settings are buried, or if you were paying close attention during sign-up to the teeny little checkbox that would release you from the advertiser's clutches. But most people haven't a clue about how to do that. Advertisers and marketers online seem to like this sort of thing because they believe it makes you want to buy stuff from them. But I think all it does is turn people off. 
It treats people like meat, and it gives the lie to all those warm and fuzzy words like members and community that web services love to use. It seems to me that a much better approach is opt-in rather than opt-out. Under this system, you'd never see any ads or offers unless you actively chose to join a club or program designed to bring you deals or buying opportunities for products or services you really want. You'd agree to provide certain personal info and to receive the ads and offers in a format acceptable to you. Pop-ups, banner ads, emails, and you'd be able to turn it all off easily just by asking. In return, you'd get really good prices and you'd see ads only for things that truly interested you, like appliances if you were redoing a kitchen or CDs by your favorite artist. This approach is called permission marketing and its chief evangelist is web pioneer Seth Godin who wrote a book by that title. Permission marketing advocates point out that most people are perfectly willing to give up some personal profiling information and to look at online ads if they have explicitly given permission. They will happily participate if they feel they're seeing interesting products and services, getting a great price, and if they remain in control. It's not a new idea. Specialized catalog retailers and companies like American Express have known for years that if you treat customers like members of a club, they'll respond. Yet in the early years of the web, the approach has been to hit everyone over the head with obnoxious, intrusive ads in the hopes that a few day souls will respond. It doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make good use of the medium. Pop-up ads must die. You've probably heard people, including maybe even us, tell you to be skeptical of the information that you see on the web. And that's good advice, because many times the source is biased, like press releases that masquerade as news, but are actually just pure corporate or political propaganda. And often the source is downright ignorant, like people who just mouth off as experts in a particular topic in an online forum, but they don't have a clue what they're talking about. But lately I've noticed that things are getting more insidious, with a bunch of situations I've tended to lump under the heading of information quality. In these situations, you get data, and it looks like information, but it's not. I mean, what I'm talking about here is every bit as useless as the ignorant sources you talked about, but it doesn't come off that way because it's presented in an ostensibly reliable, authoritative way. Right. Now, we talked about one good example on another show, online maps that turn out to be not as reliable as you'd like. Yeah, and that's precisely the kind of example I'm talking about, but that's just the tip of a very large and dubious iceberg. I mean, a few weeks ago, I was traveling to San Francisco and staying at a hotel near the airport, so I looked up the hotel's phone number in four different very popular online directories before I left. Well, the closest I came to getting the number was the number for the hotel's gift shop. I mean, in the end, I had to pick up the phone and call directory assistance, which is obviously what I should have done in the first place. Yeah, well, I've had similar problems with company websites. I mean, a lot of the time when I'm reviewing a tech product, I'll check out the company's website to find out very basic information. I mean, how much is said product? I mean, how is it spelled? That kind of thing. I mean, in theory, it should cut down on the time I have to spend verifying that information over the phone. But now I've realized that I have to phone anyway because the information on the website isn't often correct. And a lot of times, databases and links will lead you to think something's there that clearly isn't. Check this out. We'll do a search for Susan Gregory Schmidlap on AltaVista. It finds nothing, but it does put up an ad for about.com asking if you want expert human guide about that subject. But of course, it doesn't bother asking about .com first whether it really has any info about the topic. And when you go there, of course, it doesn't. So what we're talking about is essentially fake information. Right, and then there are those sites that claim to provide valuable consumer information by letting consumers rate the products. I mean, take the online baby emporium Baby Center, for example. It lets shoppers post comments on their experience with a certain product so you can read up on their opinions before you buy. But you've got to wonder, I mean, just how credible is this advice? I mean, after all, there is nothing to prevent the manufacturer's agents from pretending they're ordinary parents and raving about their very own products. Well, in an earlier show, we were talking about online bridal registries. So I actually used one, Macy's, to uh, order a gift for a certain bride and groom I knew. 
thank you very much. I guess you haven't received our official thank you note yet. No, you're welcome. Congratulations, Encore, but you only got one of what I sent, right? That's right so far. Well, unless you wanted more, which isn't what the site said, consider yourself lucky. I mean, for a couple of days after I ordered it, it still showed up on the site as something the happy couple still needed. Oh, my god! Do you think what have really irritated both the people who bought duplicates and me, who would just be one of several people with the same idea, and you, who would have had to take the extras back? I mean, how many mouse pads can any newlywed use anyway? It wasn't really a mouse pad, but... Okay, well, the problem is that Macy's doesn't check the item off the list until they ship it, which is brain dead. They essentially are delivering bogus information on the site till they get around to sending off the package. And that's just wrong. I mean, here's a case they've got the data, they just refuse to make use of it. And the information doesn't have to be on the web. I was stuck in a limo in a rainstorm in a traffic jam on the way to JFK Airport, and it became pretty clear I was not going to get to the gate on time. So I used a Palm 7 I was testing to see whether just maybe the plane had been delayed in all that rain. Well, no, it said right on time. But, of course, I get there, and it turns out the plane was just arriving. Well, so why didn't you just call the airline? Well, two reasons. One, I already thought I had accurate information. And two, the cell phone battery was dead. But anyway, I've had airlines get the facts wrong themselves. I mean, it's another example of what I call almost information. Yeah, well, and then there's the I know more than you do approach to data. I mean, when you look at weather.com, for example, to find out if it's going to be raining in Boston, it will ask you which Boston you want to know about. I mean, um, the one in Massachusetts. I mean, you know, how about showing me that one every time and then letting me pick Boston, New York? Yeah, and don't get me started on search engines on individual sites that are too stupid to find information you absolutely know is there. I mean, you just want to scream at the machine. But it's the same problem with information as it is with hardware and software. There's a general lack of commitment to quality and user interface design. And it's likely to make the coming era not the information age, but the age of almost information. It's time to open up that virtual mailbag and award a schlocky prize from the PR pinata. Now, several viewers... And both of us... ...have gotten a little bit tired of our repeatedly explaining what the PR pinata is week after week. So, if you still don't know, check out the website. Cleon writes, Liked your show. I see you live on opposite coasts. Who flies in, or does it only appear that you're in the same studio together? Well, Cleon, yours might seem to be a relatively straightforward question, but here on The Digital Duo, we pride ourselves on exposing the apparently simple and revealing the harrowing complexity that lies beneath. The truth is that the two of us here are just highly paid body doubles for the real Steve Manis and Susan Gregory Thomas. We just play them on TV. Get out of here or I'll call the Dobermans. In real life, Thomas and Manis are misanthropic hermits who's so loath to make public appearances that the producers had to hire us as talking heads to read their scripts. My real name is Shep Steneman. And I'm Shero G. Master Youngs. But your letter actually gave us the perfect vehicle to blackmail... You mean encourage. Yes, to encourage the real Steve and Susie and to sweeten our compensation here on Digital Duo. Okay, you got us, Cleon. We are really in the same studio, which is here in beautiful Needham, Massachusetts. Steve flies in from Seattle, and I shuttle in from New York. And Cleon, for sending us that email, we've got for you this handsome backpack, or for your personal body double, for when you need to be in two places at the same time. Now, if you want to win a really schlocky bad prize like this, visit the Digital Duo website and send us your mail. So this week's stuff, what do we think about it? Well, I'm going to just do a little clean in house and consolidate of my opinions this week and wrap them up into a delete for all. Wearable computers are just too pricey and useless for now, and the same thing goes for digital picture frames. And bad information is just bad information is bad information. Woo! The three delete hat trick, an all-time digital duo record. Set off <laughs> some fireworks or something, but I will not quite join you. Picture frames, uh, yes, that would be a delete. 
bad information, misinformation, or more often, no information, delete. But even though I am far from crazy about that wearable computer, I think it's a fascinating start. It's useful in special situations. Jury duty. Thank you. And it deserves a save for creativity and spark alone. Besides, it looks so darn cool. I'm Susan Gray Ree Thomas. I'm Steve Manis. We're two analog people. In a digital world. See, See you, you next, next time. time. Digital Duo is brought to you by Providing network solutions for the internet revolution. Alcatel, tomorrow's networks today. Where can you find millions of books online? BarnesandNoble.com if we don't have your book, nobody does. It's time for E-Trade, a proud sponsor of Digital Duo.